Welcome to Rock Shovels and Manuscripts. I'm Rick and this is Steve. And Steve, what is this brand new show all about? Oh man, I'm so excited. We're like launching a whole new season. <laughs> we are. And what we're going to do over the next several weeks is we're going to hit various topics that uh, wrap around archaeology in the Bible. Okay. For example, today we're going to talk about tombs. Okay. And we're going to introduce people to some of the major finds for archaeological tombs in Israel, how tombs were laid out, and what finding these tombs has meant and means to us. How do you think the viewer is going to benefit from watching this season? That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> that remains to be seen. Here's what I think. Um, for the believer, for the person who already believes the Bible, uh, they're going to understand its content a lot better okay. because they're going to see the historical and cultural setting that some of the biblical events have taken place in. Okay. They're also going to be strengthened in their faith to see that the things the Bible mentions that people have challenged are being substantiated through arche the archaeological record. Great. And I also like the way you've laid this out, that we're dealing with this thematically. Mm -hmm. You know, like for the first episode, we're dealing with... Tombs. Tombs. Yep. Okay, well, let's get started. <laughs> what a topic to start with, right? <laughs> <laughs> tombs, really? Well, before I go into the tombs, I, I just wanted to bring a special treat. It has nothing to do with tombs, but it was so cool when I stumbled upon it, I just wanted to share it with, with the okay. audience. So I've got, um, well, I've got a picture of something, and it's up on the screen now, and it looks like a little hand okay. shovel. Yes, it does. But there's some significance to this little hand shovel. Let me read to you from Luke. Luke chapter 1. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have just been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you might know for certainty of the things that have been taught. Okay. Okay, so this is the beginning of the book called Luke. Um, Luke wrote two books, Luke and Acts, and both of them are addressed to a guy named Theophilus. And that in and of itself confuses a lot of people. I mean, the name means God lover, Theophilus. But nowhere else in the Bible is he mentioned. Um, and it was said for years that nobody knew who he was because there was no record of a Theophilus. But that isn't really true. Great. I want to hear this. Well, there, first of all, there was some speculation. He's called most excellent or noble Theophilus. So, you know, whoever this person is, he has high rank, high standing. He's, he's a noble of some sort. But there is no Theophilus in the Roman record. In secular history, there is a Theophilus. There's a first century priest in Israel, high priest, known as Theophilus. Really? And not only do I think this makes sense because we've got a name that we can tie this to and a significant person, but the very next verse starts talking about the descendants of Aaron, mm -hmm a priest in Israel during the first century yep. and starts talking about priestly things. So here we have Luke, who's playing the historian, trying to introduce the story of Jesus to a priest. And so what's he start talking about? He doesn't start talking about Yeshua. He starts talking about a priest. That makes total sense. It makes total sense. So let me get into the story and you'll see where that little shovel comes in. Okay. Verse five. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division, priest, 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 priestly division of Abiah, and his wife Elizabeth also was a descendant of Aaron. Okay, let me start off by saying this changes the whole reason that the story is laid out this way. Absolutely. By understanding that it's written to somebody who's potentially a high priest. Yep. Completely we talk changed. about uh, Elizabeth, we talk about the descendant of Aaron, we talk about. Um, Soon, John the Baptist is coming into the picture, okay. who's a descendant of a priest. <laughs> Later, we talk about Jesus, but he's not a descendant of a priest. So it seems to me that if you want to get a priest's attention, not only do you start talking about priests, but he might have known this priest. This might actually be a personal, well, maybe I didn't know him, but I knew his cousin. I know his uncle. That, you know, it, right. very close. Right. And then when he starts talking about what priests do, He's going to think, oh, Luke knows what he's talking about because he's telling me about the job I had. And look, he's got it right. And obviously he's writing, as you mentioned, that this is most excellent. So this is somebody in, in a high-ranking position. Mm -hmm. 
And it's somebody who has great influence. Yep, and if it's the Theophilus, I think it is, it's the high priest, or was a high priest, a former high priest. So here's what it says about um, Zachariah and his wife, Elizabeth. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well along in years. Um, just a little side note, it was a shame and it felt like a curse from God to be barren. Mm -hmm. the, the main thing that somebody wanted in these days was a descendant, a child. And to be a high priest and to not have a child, part of, or a priest, pardon me, Part of you is thinking, hey, I'm a priest. I'm, a right, I'm right with God. I'm living a good life. Then why is he cursing me like this? What have I done wrong? That's very practical for every believer today to recognize that when things that appear to be bad in your life does not mean that you're being cursed by God. Not at all, because her womb is being preserved for one of the greatest men who's ever lived. The first birth is going to be the, a holy birth. It says he is filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. So it's not like she's being cursed. Mm -hmm. She's in the wings, mm -hmm. getting ready to come out on stage for the leading role. Like so many things in life, it's a timing issue. Exactly. Yeah. So they had no children. Verse eight, once when Zacharias' division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the, assembler, uh, all the people assembled, and they were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zachariah saw him, he was startled, and he was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, don't be afraid. And he goes on to tell him he's going to have a son, and this becomes John the Baptist, and he's going to be the forerunner of the Messiah. So I'm in Israel just a couple of years ago. And I'm at one of the best antiquity shops, has some of the best stuff in Israel, museum quality stuff. In fact, some of the stuff from the museum is in this shop. Wow. Similar items. And if you're like me, you're drooling, right? Oh, I am so <laughs> drooling. They show me that little shovel. Can I touch it? So the photograph, Did they let you touch it? oh yeah, that's oh, my okay. hand holding the shovel. It's like, oh. So, and here's why I got so excited about it. Okay. Yeah, that's my, my hand. Holding the shovel. Now what's the date on this? First century. Wow. And it's an incense shovel. So this shovel was used in the holy place. No way. In the first century to offer incense to God. That's amazing. John's dad, Zachariah, was a first century priest who offered incense. There's a chance that that shovel was in his hand. And that it was before the presence of God, you know, on the other side of the curtain, right before the... Because practically, when you think about it, something like the shovel that we just saw on the screen, how often would you really need to replace that? Exactly. So, it's not made out of wood. It's like a bronze type shovel. It would so last forever. There's a possibility. Well, it's 2,000 years old. It has lasted there, forever. <laughs> well, there's a possibility then that that actually could be. Exactly. The, yes. So just touching it was, wow, what a connection. Amazing. Now... That's not the whole story. And by the way, I kind of jumped to the conclusion because I didn't know what it was. He said, oh, it's an incense shovel from the first century. And I thought, that's cool. But he might have just said a shovel. I said, well, what kind of shovel? Well, an incense shovel. And then I thought for a minute. I said, well, there were two places where you would have needed a shovel. At the brazen altar, which was huge, so the shovel would have been huge, or the incense altar. So I'm making this connection in my mind while I'm standing there. This would have been the incense shovel. Whoa! <laughs> I got all excited and I'm holding it. And, and it was for sale. All, I, all you had to do is come up with like $30,000 and it could be yours. Someday. Such a deal. <laughs> Such a deal. <laughs> so here's why it's way cool and indirectly ties to a tomb. The next image I want to show is a picture I took of something called Absalom's tomb. It's called Absalom's tomb because it was thought for generations that this was where King David's son, Absalom, was buried. In fact, observant Jews, when they would walk by this tomb, would chuck rocks at it and say things and, you know, kind of curse the name of Absalom because mm -hmm. he was such a bad person and he disrespected his father mm -hmm. and he brought war to the kingdom. Right. And so this was a place where, well, that tomb got hit by a lot of rocks. Yes. But then they came to realize that based again, on archaeology, 
that this style of tomb was not used in the 7th and 8th centuries B.C. or the 10th century B.C. when Absalom would have lived. Okay, where are you going with this? This was a 1st century tomb. Wow. Now, we know that this area, which is right outside the Temple Mount, this is just right, you know, two-minute walk from the Temple Mount. This was where the wealthy people were buried. This is where priests were buried. In fact, right next to this is a, another set of tombs called the, the Tombs of the Sons of Hazir, which are priestly family. Okay. So this is a row of priest tombs. This tomb, they discovered the oldest New Testament inscription outside of the Bible. Now, as we're looking at this, it looks like it has been beat up a bit. Well, again, it's 2,000 years old. And had rocks thrown at yep. it for how long? And how many wars have gone through mm -hmm. there? And how many uh, earthquakes? The fact that it's still standing is in and of itself amazing. So we have the New Testament. It's in manuscript form. But this is the first time they found a reference outside of the New Testament somewhere else. So this is the oldest New Testament reference. And Luke 2.25 was found inscribed on this. Do you have that in front of you? I do. Would you read it for us? And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. So, for whatever reason, this passage is scratched into this tomb. Oldest reference outside the New Testament. What did Simeon do? He recognized the Messiah. He was a very key person. And those events happened within glancing distance of where this tomb sits. So I found that interesting. But what really blew my mind is what they found from the fourth century. They found an inscription on here, and I quote, this is the tomb of Zechariah the martyr, the holy priest, the father of John. No way, <laughs> are you kidding? Scratched right into the tomb. So, now here's the two questions that I run through my mind. I have never heard that absolutely, before. Absolutely, absolutely. So here's the two questions that run through my mind. First of all, is it really 4th century? Because these things are subject to interpretation. Yes. What if it's earlier? Yeah. And secondly, even if it is 4th century, is it accurate? We do know it's right outside the temple. We do know it's where the priests were buried. And for whatever reason, somebody scratched in here that that's Zachariah's tomb, the father of John the Baptist. What do you do with that? <laughs> <laughs> well, it totally changes the way you look at what I've known as Absalom's pillar. Mm -hmm. It completely changes it. So now what do we call it? I don't want to call it Absalom's tomb anymore. I wouldn't either. Maybe, That's pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> this is our second picture, by the way. It's got a man standing at the bottom for scale. I wanted people to see actually how high this yeah, was. Yeah, it's huge. It's really, really big. And anybody can see that when they go to Israel. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, right along where all the other uh, tombs are at the, at the base there. Yep. Wow, that's amazing. Well, we have a lot more things to cover just dealing with tombs. So don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Rock Shovels and Manuscripts. I'm here with Steve, and we're dealing with the topic of tombs. Where are we going from here? Well, we had just talked about Absalom's tomb, yep. which now we see really shouldn't be called Absalom's tomb. That blew my mind. Oh, it's and exciting. Really, it is, because it's external evidence for a New Testament, specifically a gospel account. And most people don't know about it, but it's well documented. That's incredible. Yeah, it's awesome. Okay, lead us. Okay, so Israel is an amazing place. Sometimes you could just trip over things. Anytime they build something, if they stumble across something archaeological, they have to stop. Mm -hmm. Antiquities Authority has to come, has to determine what to do at that point. Sometimes even roadways are affected, but here's one that sort of is and sort of isn't. We've got a photograph of a first century tomb right off the highway. That I've seen that. I've driven by it and just was amazed. Yeah, we actually stopped, risked our lives crossing the street, <laughs> went inside the tomb, took pictures, had a good time. But I wanted people to see the layout, at least from the front, because that big round stone, mm -hmm. there's that part in the Gospels where it talks about the angel moving the stone. Yes. Well, this would be a perfect example of that type and, of stone. And you look at that, I mean, it's just absolutely what you would think is the stereotypical tomb for yep. a first century. Yeah. Yep. So I just wanted to show the people what a real first century tomb looked like. It's no longer subject to debate. This is a real first century tomb. This is what they look like. It's not a made up account. Nope. Probably the most 
famous tomb, or at least one of the most famous tombs, is known as the Tomb of the Patriarchs, the Cave of the Patriarchs, or the Cave of Machpelah. Okay. It's the holiest site in Judaism, second to the Temple Mount, but it's the oldest holy site in Judaism. And it's in an Arab area today, a Muslim area. So it's difficult for Jewish people to go there, but many still go. Sometimes there's problems, sometimes there's not. I have not yet been. I was just going to say the same thing, that we have been in around the area, but never stopped because of the area. Yeah, but one of the things, this is one of the well-established sites. This isn't one of those, well, we think so-and-so or such-and-such -such happened here. This is pretty much all archaeologists agree, this is really the burial place of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, and Leah. That is amazing. It is. It really, really is. And so, over the years, you know, they've built shrines and things around the tomb. So this is what the exterior looks like. But we actually have a look of the interior where there's, I don't even know what to call it. This is built over where Isaac supposedly okay. was buried. Okay. So if you were to walk inside today, this is what you would see. The burial place of the patriarch Isaac. That is amazing that to this day we know exactly the place. One of the things that I so enjoy about this is there's a lot of discussion today about who owns the land, mm -hmm. who has the rights. Like, this is now a Palestinian-controlled area. Do they have the right to it? Well, I'm not a lawyer, but I know whoever can come up with a deed with their name on it might have a good claim to the land. So let me read to you one of the oldest deeds in the world that refers to this exact parcel of land. It comes from Genesis chapter 23. Here's what it says, I'm in verse six. Sir, listen to us. You are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will refuse you his tomb for burying your dead. Then Abraham rose, bowed down before the people of the land, the Hittites, mm -hmm. and he said to them, if you're willing to let me bury my dead, then listen to me and intercede with Ephron, son of Zohar, on my behalf. So he'll sell me the cave of Machpelah, which belongs to him and is at the end of his field. Ask him to sell it to me for the full price as a burial site among you. Ephron answers Abraham, listen to me, my Lord. The land is worth 400 shekels of silver. So Abraham agrees to Ephron's terms weighs out the price that he had named in the hearing of all the Hittites, 400 shekels of silver. So Ephron's field in Machpelah near Mamre, both the field and the cave in it, and all the trees within the borders of the field was deeded to Abraham and his property in the presence of all the Hittites who had come to the gate of the city. Afterward, Abraham buried his wife Sarah in the cave. What sure bit of evidence could you have than to have a parcel that you have purchased listed in the Bible? And the amazing <laughs> thing is, they offered it to him for free. And he said, no, I will pay full price for it. I skipped that part, but it, that's in there too. So there's absolutely no doubt that he paid the price and it was deeded over to him. Exactly. One of the reasons this is contentious, though, is because not only do the Jewish people claim Abraham, but the Muslims claim Abraham also. Right. And so they don't argue that it's his tomb. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they just claim rights to it. But uh, we don't see, uh, we see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Mm -hmm. We don't see his other son of That's Hagar right. Ishmael mentioned in there. That's right. So. That's true. <laughs> Do we have any other pictures of that? Because we've always seen the picture from outside. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we do see that inner a constructed area over the tomb. But do we have anything else indicating this area? More of a raw picture from the, f the field, what the cave might have looked like without okay. the uh, tombs over it. You know, there's a burial hole. Wow. It's kind of what it could have looked like. Okay. It was a um, cave initially, natural, but over time, Abraham buried more and more people in it. We don't know if he had to start quarrying. Don't know. Okay. And who else might have used the tomb over the years? But more evidence to support the biblical story. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's talked about. There it is. Now, we can talk about the Hittites another time, but they're mentioned in here. And up until, you know, modern times, 
people who didn't believe in the Bible didn't believe in Hittites because they weren't mentioned anywhere else than the Bible. And yet here they are as the witnesses to a land deed transaction, and it's later proven, just like the Bible says, that they were an established and significant and large empire. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. It is. Okay, where are we going next? Well, I talked about the cave of Machpelah being one of the most famous and the holy site in Judaism. But there's a couple of other tombs that vie for being famous. Okay. They're much more modern compared to that cave, but they've got millions of pilgrims visiting them every year. And so in modern times, they're more famous. But in antiquity, it would be Abraham's tomb for sure. This next shot, this is the face of what's known as the garden tomb. You can see a little stairway leading up into a door and a trench right there. Okay. In that trench, some say, would have been the large stone that could have rolled right in front of this okay. door. That makes sense. Now, there's debate about this tomb. It's age. Some say the garden tomb is where Yeshua himself was buried. And they have their reasons, but now scholarly research is leaning away from it. Mm -hmm. They say, no, we don't think so, because for one, the layout of the tomb is inconsistent with first century tombs. Gotcha. I don't have any internal diagrams to show, but here's how the first century tombs were, as opposed to the tombs way back in the days of Abraham. From like the days of Abraham up to roughly, you know, the second century BC, you would have a area where you'd go in and there'd be like a slab or I'll just call it a porch where you can lay out the bodies yes. and they would just lay there mm -hmm. until they disintegrated. Mm -hmm. And then they would take the bones, put them in a hole somewhere in that same hole. Right lay out the next generation, lay out the next generation. And it's like a year later, they go back to visit. Yeah, it doesn't take, take that place. long yeah. in, in that climate. Mm -hmm. But in the first century, you would have an opening like you see here, but when you go inside, there would be various rooms. And in the rooms would be niches carved into the bedrock so that you were depth-wise, and you would place the body inside that hole. Okay. Very similar to a modern-day mausoleum-type mm -hmm. situation. This one does not have that layout. Right. This one has more like the benches. It's, it's unique because even the benches, there's only a couple of them and they're small. So most are saying, no, this isn't it. Furthermore, based on what they think the layout of the walls would have been back in the first century, Yeshua was brought outside the walls. They think this might have been inside the walls during the first century. Okay. But they're not certain where all the walls were either. So it has some problems to fit it, the biblical it story. It does. It has some problems. But it's a really cool tomb. And it, it's not out of the question. Mm -hmm. It's in the general area. Yes. And it's obviously the tomb of a rich person, as was the tomb Yeshua was buried in, because you can see a large wine press in that area. So we knew that this was owned by somebody who had some means. There's some possibilities tied to it. And yet, like I said, millions of pilgrims flock here. It is a contender for the burial place of Yeshua. And one of the things that gives it some of its strength is this verse in the scripture right here, which goes to the next photo. It's from Luke 23, 33. And it says, when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him, the place of the skull. Now here, Looking at this side of the cliff, you can't see why this might be called the place of the skull. But let's take a look at the next photograph. Okay. This is what uh, it looked yes. like just about 100 years ago. Yeah. Totally looks like a skull face. Yes, it does. And so they say, hey, this is the place of the skull. Mm -hmm. This is where he was crucified, and he was buried right next to it. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre now has the site that others say is the tomb. Don't know if that's the place either. It's a good contender. Mm -hmm. But honestly... What matters most is what's written on the door of this church in the garden. And we have that photo also, if you, I could trouble you to bring that up for me. On the door it says, he's not here, he is risen. It doesn't matter where he was buried. I mean, it's cool to think we can go to a site and see the place where Yeshua was buried, yes. but that's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. The important part is that he got up again. There are no bones left in there. That's right. There are no <laughs> bones to be found for Yeshua. So when we, we talk about the theme of tombs in this first episode, 
it, it's striking to me that the place of the dead has such a prominent role in pointing to the place for those of life. In other words, this story of where these famous individuals within the biblical story have passed away and been remembered points ultimately to where we find life. It was their faith that made them and put them into the biblical story. One of the reasons we pointed out the tombs of the priests, they were right outside the temple. They believed in the resurrection of the dead. So the prime real estate for burial was the prime real estate for resurrection. They wanted to be resurrected right outside the temple so that when the Messiah comes, they'd be there instantly and ready. Which is a nice segue into are we ready? And how are we living our life? Are we living it for today? Are we looking to the point where we too may pass away before the Lord comes mm -hmm. and preparing for that day when the Lord comes back? 1 Corinthians 15, 20, Indeed, Messiah has been raised from the dead, but he's the first fruits. That means more is to follow. That's us. <laughs> so there will be a day when every one of these tombs that we've been talking about, whether they have bones in them currently or had at one point in time, every one of those bones will be reassembled back into living bodies and they'll stand before the Lord on the last and final To day. receive their judgment and their reward. Absolutely. <laughs> well, we hope you enjoyed the first edition of Rock Shovels and Manuscripts. I'm Rick. This is Steve. And we're just glad you're with us. We will see you next time for the next episode. God bless. This episode was produced by and for God's Learning Channel. If you're enjoying this series, your financial support will help us keep this program on the air. Simply send your contribution to God's Learning Channel, P.O. Box 61000, Midland, Texas 79711-1000. Or log on to our website at www.glc.us.com and donate using PayPal. Please be sure to designate which program your contribution is intended to support. Thank you for helping us make unique quality programming a reality. Order your copy of this program from the GLC Bookstore by calling the numbers or visiting the website on your screen. Please include the program number when ordering.